Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the inaugural Victorian Global EdTech and Innovation Expo we are delivering in partnership with the State of Victoria. Before we begin formal proceedings, allow me to pause to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and they recognise their continuous and unbroken connection to the land, waters and culture across the country. I pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and I personally welcome any Indigenous people with us this, uh, today. For our international visitors, allow me to briefly explain why we pause for this important acknowledgement at the beginning of our meeting. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were the first custodians of the land we call Australia. This relationship has never been broken. We begin our events by acknowledging the unique position of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australian culture, uh, culture history and the future. It's my great honour to lead Edge of Growth, Australia's EdTech and Innovation Industry Knowledge Hub. Through connection and collaboration, we accelerate Australia's EdTech ecosystem globally. Edge of Growth exists because of the vision of our foundation partners, Charles Sturt, Deakin, Griffith, La Trobe, Monash Universities and Navitas, founded Edge of Growth in 2017. These organisations saw the role that Australia can play in reimagining education in the digital borderless online world. We have an exciting program ahead of us today. And what I'd like to do is begin by acknowledging and thanking our special relationship with the State of Victoria and welcome Candace Tan from Global Victoria. Thanks, David. Good morning. My name is Candace Tan from Global Victoria. And on behalf of the Victorian government, I'd like to say how pleased we are to be partnering with Edge of Growth on this wonderful initiative. It's great to see people dialing in from all around the world to our inaugural Victorian Global EdTech and Innovation Expo. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional Aboriginal owners of country throughout Victoria, their ongoing yep. connection to this land, and we pay our respects to their culture and their elders, past, present, and emerging. Global Victoria is the trade agency of the Victorian government. We open the world to Victorian businesses and welcome the business world to Victoria. We do this by building the skills and knowledge of Victorian businesses to grow on the international stage, promoting the state's world-class industry capabilities to international audiences, and leading the nation as the best city in Australia to study in. Our international network of over 20 Victorian government trade and investment offices located in key export markets can open doors to contacts who can expand your horizons and help make your global ambitions a reality. The Victorian government has outlined its objective to build Victoria as an edtech and e-learning hub in its international education strategy. Melbourne, Victoria is a global thought leader in learning and assessment. It's the center for Australia's online program management and has a strong reputation for delivering high quality international education. Victoria has an exciting and diverse range of edtech companies. The sector is thriving and leading Australia in education innovation for administration systems, student management, and learning management. As David mentioned, today we're gonna to hear from some of Victoria's thought leaders who are experts in ed tech and online learning, and also hear from a sample of Victoria's fantastic ed tech companies. It's great to have this opportunity today to showcase some of Victoria's ed tech and online learning capabilities. Thank you all for joining us. I'm now gonna introduce Ryan O'Hare and Claire Field. Claire Field is the principal of Claire Field and Associates, a consultancy practice offering strategic advice on VET international education and private higher education to providers, investors and other tertiary education stakeholders. Claire served as the CEO of the Australian Council for Private Education and Training from 2010 to 2014. Ryan O'Hare, as CEO of Key Path Education Australia and Asia Pacific, Ryan leads the, sector, second, sorry, the sector's largest online program management, OPM business, focused on the postgraduate sector. Key path partner with many of Australia's leading public universities to significantly scale their online offering through a combination of capital investment and best in class online education services, specialising in the areas of learning design, market intelligence, digital marketing and student life cycle services. Claire and David will be having a conversation on building new student experience in partnership with online program managers. Um, Ryan, lovely to, to have you here for a chat, uh, particularly uh, COVID-19 pandemic, everybody's gone online. So I wanted to start with a provocative question first. Uh, if you think about traditional, particularly higher education learning experiences, 
uh, it's 500 people crammed into a lecture hall and the occasional tutorial if you're not too busy working or at the pub to, uh, to pop along to. So we've had a pandemic, everybody has had to move online. Isn't it really just as simple as a webinar and some PowerPoints? Why is online program management anything more than that? What, what do we need to know about it in terms of the student experience? Uh, morning, Claire. Thanks, thanks for the nice easy one. Uh, and thanks to Global Victoria and EduGrowth for the um, invite here today. Um, yes, I mean, you could do online as simple as that and do a sort of, you know, an extended Zoom conference with some PowerPoint and, and PDF slides and deliver that to 500 people. Um, it, it wouldn't be any good and uh, students would hate it and they'd question why they're paying a fortune for it. But I guess you could do it. Um, so, I, so businesses like us and anyone that sort of works in the online sector, and your question was provocative, but a little bit cheeky, everyone knows that's not how we deliver online education very well these days. So uh, it doesn't need an OPM or, or an online program management business to tell you that. So the last couple of months have, yes, seen universities all around the world, and I'm sure you like, like most other people saw that great institution Cambridge yesterday declare that they were going fully online for I think the next 12 months of the foreseeable future. So, uh, yeah, we're no institutions are immune to this. I think is the uh, I think is the lesson from that. So, what we've seen over the last couple of months are universities around the world transition very, very quickly, very, very dirtily, and, and very, very uh, randomly online to be able to continue education. I, I think most people in that value chain, the students, the institutions, and the general public cannot expect it to be exemplary learning. Uh, they, you cannot transition an entire university's delivery model to online in a matter of weeks and months uh, when you haven't done that previously and expect it to be great. Uh, and I noticed, I was on a, another panel last week where I was giving some feedback that, you know, some students are up in arms over this and that, you know, they're paying a fortune for, for something that isn't what they expected. And that's true. Um, but I do think there's a, a unique difference we need to touch on, uh, and that's that businesses like us uh, working with universities, we aim, to, uh, we aim to deliver programs to students who are choosing online as their first and primary method of study. They want to study online, it fits within their life, they may be working full time and they haven't got a chance to get to campus or they're geographically uh, a long way away from it. That is uniquely different from a cohort and a significant market of undergraduate or postgraduate students whose first choice was going to a campus and sitting in that lecture theater that you just talked about and trying to chat up the person next to them and you know go down to the pub afterwards. That is a uniquely different experience to now be shoehorned into a, a sort of mediocre online experience. And, and I say mediocre because that's as good as anyone could make it in the short period of time we've got. The next step, which I'm sure we're going to get to talk to, is how do we improve that experience so that it does uh, ring true and add value over the long term? So why don't you take us there? Talk it through because it is the student experience. Uh, it's going to take those who've been doing face-to-face -face traditionally uh, some time to get there. Others who've been working with OPMs like uh, yours and others are already offering a very rich student experience in the online world. Um, what does that student experience look, what can it look like and, and what do people need to be thinking about if they're only treading, uh, dipping their toes in the water at the moment around online learning? Yeah, great question. We like to talk about this as good learning irrespective of the modality. Um, so good learning is not necessarily 500 people sitting in a lecture theater any, any more than it is 500 people sitting in a Zoom meeting. Uh, the, the likelihood of deep embedded learning through either of those is, is pretty small. Um, so one of the things we talk about is that online learners need support and infrastructure and an ecosystem for them in, a, in all aspects of their life, not just in the online course that they're sitting within. So we touch quite heavily with our universities on not just the online course that's being built and ensuring that there's good, good rigors of pedagogy and user experience, but also have we thought through the time that this is going to be delivered, how we're going to assess when students are going to engage, um, how they're going to be able to get into that course in the first place, 
uh, how we're going to be able to service them outside of it. So mostly universities are set up for students to go and get something. I'll go to the student services area for support. I'll go here for pastoral care. I'll go there for uh, my lecture. They're not going anywhere online. They're, they're typically on their phone or, uh, or sitting in front of a laptop. So ensuring you have an infrastructure set up around um, around your online delivery is first and foremost. We have a lot of universities come to us and say, can you build us some courses and deliver them online and make them look pretty? And yeah, of course you can, but that's sort of focusing on about 10% of the, of, the, um, of the work we have to do. Secondly, we need to think drastically differently about how people engage online. So people don't watch three hours worth of YouTube videos, they watch two minutes. People don't sit on Facebook and read reams and reams and reams of content. Uh, they engage, they, they give something, they get back. It's so what, what the elements of, sort of social constructivist learning that we've taken from a lot of social media should play a part in online learning as well. So we advocate shorter bite-sized learning, engaged learning, feedback, the ability to work in groups, the ability to, to, to test their knowledge, uh, be assessed more quickly uh, and, and get an assessment of where they're at. Uh, so really these are good learning principles irrespective of whether it's online or, or on campus. I think the big thing that we have learned is the, the, uh, the need to have not just good online delivery but really good online facilitation and teaching. So that is different and I, I use the, I've used the example quite a bit of my of watching my daughter going through homeschooling like everyone else and thinking wow, I now feel for the teacher who's having to pivot and do this quickly uh, through a Zoom or Skype session. So the role of the teacher and the facilitator on, in online is absolutely crucial for engagement, uh, for retention of learning, uh, and, and to be able to navigate an online cohort of students. So I think we really have to think as a sector about how we educate that cohort of instructors, academics, facilitators, how we give them the professional development requirements um, that they need in order to be able to do this effectively. And we spend an awful lot of time as an OPM with our universities, helping them think through that. It's not just about the course you build, but about how it's going to be instructed and taught and delivered. So there's just a couple of elements. Can I, um, thank you, uh, tease out one more, which it seems to me we're able to use technology to do uh, in a virtual learning environment more so than uh, in a face-to-face -face traditional environment and that is to understand and move quickly to respond to students who are at risk of dropping out that uh, the power of AI uh, the data that you collect on students and their engagement with their learning in an online environment is potentially much richer than it is in the 500 people in a lecture theatre, the, the old uh, school model. Uh, did you want to talk a little bit about, uh, about those opportunities for institutions to step in preemptively perhaps and, uh, and engage more with, with at-risk students who, who might be at, at risk of, of early uh, exit? Yeah, great question. I, I could talk about this all day, but I'll, I'll try and highlight a couple of points uh, that are pretty relevant to this. So the first is that there, there is no pill for, uh, for attrition that you can just drop in at a point in time when a cohort of students or a, or a particular student is disengaged. Um, in retention and engagement, uh, retention and reducing attrition comes back to initial engagement with the students. Have you set the expectations effectively for what they are to do, how they are to learn, have you learned about them, are you creating an environment and a course that is distinct and adapts to their learning style? So engaging with students ahead of time is the best pill for reducing uh, attrition over time. Um, that said, there is a significant amount of data that you would, that mostly universities collect currently uh, through a lot of systems they have. They will now get reams more data around login, engagement, participation at certain times, um, assessment, uh, a variety of different uh, a variety of different pieces of data. The problem I think we often find as, uh, as a sector is we have too much data and, and, and we're unable to do anything with it. So what we're conscious of is not loading already busy academics or faculties with more and more data about here's what this cohort of students are doing, here's what this per here's why they think is that this person hasn't, uh, hasn't logged in in the last half an hour, and trying to make it fundamentally simple for them to take actions from it. 
So at the end of one piece of advice that we do give is that at the end of every delivery of every course, have a look at the trend related data that came from that. Did students struggle uh, with a certain piece of assessment? Did students not engage at a certain uh, component of content delivery? Did students literally not log in on Thursday because every, every one of them had a big night on Wednesday? So look at the trend data that comes at the end of the delivery of course, and then you can make changes going forward. I think we often get a little bit too hung up by input data like logins and you know time spent in discussion boards and things like that. Have a look at the output data and make changes based on that. Fantastic. And my last question, which I think we've just got a bit of time for, uh, international education is an important um, offering that Australia and, uh, and other countries around the world uh, give, um, and it's certainly been something we've been focused on for a number of years here. With a um, very much more digital um, potential student cohort in uh, developing parts of the, the world, Asia, Africa, Latin America, what are the opportunities, do you think, for institutions to be um, offering more than just the traditional come to Australia or the UK or, or wherever for your three years. What do, what do you see as, as opportunities in terms of online delivery to a, a potentially a, a broader cohort? Yeah, good question. I'll give two quick answers to this because I know we're running out of time. So, so the, the region which surrounds Australia, Southeast Asia and, and broader into Asia, that is the most mo engaged mobile internet region in the world. So Google, Bain, company, Temasek released great data around this. The markets like Thailand, Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, um, they all use mobile devices for all aspects of their life around about two to three times more than the rest of the world. So this is a region that is used to using digital devices, digital technology to improve their lives, whether it's in e-commerce, retail, travel, ride sharing, ordering food. It, it is, this was pre-COVID too, by the way, I should say. It is, un, it, is, it would be incredible to me that this audience won't expect their education experience to go the same way. If you're able to make their lives quicker, easier, more accessible and better uh, through their device, um, in every other aspect of their life, why would they expect education to be any different? Second point I'll make is that if we follow, if we follow the dollars, which as a sort of you know, exciting uh, wannabe economist I do, um, we notice that regions surrounding us, China, India and others, have significantly dwarfed most other markets in the world in the last five years on education in uh, digital education investment. So China and India now are by far the leading venture capital funded uh, education investment countries in the world. All of those regions, all of that investment has been going towards, not towards the bricks and mortar uh, and increase of universities and campuses and adding more schools, but into things like um, test prep, English language assessment, post-school learning, uh, online support, tutoring. So what we're getting is a, is a generation of people coming from pre-K, K-12 and into the tertiary sector who are used to supplementary, supplementing their learning through digital support, digital tutoring, digital enablement, test prep. Again, it is, it is completely incredulous to me that this generation will not expect the university sector to adapt and go the same way. So pre-COVID, we were seeing all of this shift in movement. So what that means for us as a sector is we have to be thinking about, at the very least, how do we get more flexible and blended in terms of our delivery of education to the largest region that we service outside of Australia. Um, we in Australia, and especially in, in here in Melbourne, the home of the, the OPM sector and the home of EdTech Innovation, who have been in this online space for around about 10 years, have an absolute market leadership opportunity here to be in front, be ahead, uh, and to help support the, the expectation that's going to come from students that blended learning is absolutely part of their remit. Thank you. And I think uh, just to further emphasise the point that you're making, what we've also seen with COVID is governments that have traditionally been focused on uh, 
not interested in online learning, privileging face to face and seeing online as potentially poorer quality. We've seen governments making directives like the Chinese and, and other governments that online is good, fine and changing regulations uh, to reflect that. So I think it will be a combination of both student use and demand and governments coming to an understanding that done well online education can and is um, a, a valid learning yeah. experience. Yeah, you only have to look at the announcements from out of India and China at a policy level over the last six months with regard to acceptance of online in those markets. So I, I do think, and I'll finish with, obviously COVID is going to impact student movement and, and transnational student uh, movement to and from Australia. I, I do think we can't expect the same volume of international students coming on shore into Australia over the next few years. So does that mean they don't want an Australian degree and accreditation? I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it won't impact their ability to want a degree from Melbourne or Sydney or anywhere. But in order to be able to access that student, we're gonna to have to think differently about how we deliver to them. Terrific. Well, thank you very much for sharing your uh, insights uh, with us, uh, Ryan. And I think we're now. Oh no, no, I'll I'll jump in and I'll actually oh, want to talk. Please. Yeah, yes. we, we'll, we'll, we've got some questions. I know that. Uh, just a reminder to the audience: you can put questions in the Q and A box, and um, we'll we can answer them. I just wanted to um, ask you something, Ryan. I really about. I, I guess I have two questions in my mind about the OPM model. I think it's what you're delivering is fully accredited AQF accredited courses, correct? Correct. And, and we're obviously seeing new business models come about with, for example, micro credentials and micro courses and boot camps and immersive programs. I'm really interested in your view around whether or not we're going to see that market increase more and whether or not that may be done in partnership with external partners like an OPM. Yeah, it will increase. So I think what we've seen, uh, if I can just quickly jump back, the OPM yeah. sector in Australia started around about seven or eight years ago um, with one or two university partnerships between private providers like ourselves and others. Um, we estimate there isn't great public data on this because no one really shares it. As I think, you know, Claire and, and, and you and I could talk about it all day long. But I, we estimate around about 15 to maybe 20 universities in Australia now work with an OPM. So almost half the sector uh, is working with an online program management business. Now you can argue the, the merits or cons to that as well. But what we've seen, especially over the last two years, is a, a divergence in business model, in delivery, in, um, in length or accreditation or non-accreditation of the course, uh, in the substance of how it's delivered, in some flexibility around blended versus fully online, as well as the influence now of, of what was the MOOC uh, providers and MOOC sector, coming in and offering a lot of shorter courses. So Future Learn, edX, et cetera. So a number of universities partner with groups like that. So what I think all of that will mean is that there will be fundamental change in the length of course that's offered, how it's offered to the demographic that gets it, at the price point that it's offered, whether it stacks into something greater. I, You're I talking the, about domestic students, right? <clears throat> I, I, I'm talking about domestic and international, yeah. I think, okay. I, think, I think the international is certainly going to accelerate as a result of COVID, yeah. Um, we did a session a, a couple of, I don't know, a couple of days ago. We had Beverly Oliver and David Bowser talking about online learning. And um, I don't remember who suggested, I think it might have been David, that, that we're going, that we potentially may see sort of, you know, fully online universities only, right? Do you share that view? Do you share the view that the online, that universities can be a fully online program and process? Yes. Okay. I, I, if, if, if you're not, if, if you're as a university not thinking about that right now, why are you not? Well, you've got no choice because you are right now, right? So, so let me, let, let me, let me, give, let me right give you, uh, let me give you one piece of data. So 2018 was the first year on in record in Australia where more Australian students started their master's degree online than went to a campus. First year in record. Uh, and those lines have been going that way and the on campus attendance that way for some time. Those lines will never cross again. So I'm interested in the students, volume though. 
what's the volume? I, I, my, my understanding is that the volume of total volume of students doing postgraduate is actually declining. Right? Is that true or not? So the total volume is declining. Uh, that said, across the across the forty ish universities, there are around about fifteen or so that have significantly increased in the last yeah. five years. Of those fifteen, twelve of them have done so because they've gone online. So overall, the overall volume would have increased if more had have gone online. Okay. And there are issues, David, in terms of particular courses. So MBA enrolments are down health and other um, courses, um, post-grad enrolments are up. In, okay. It's, it's one of those interesting things. You're starting to, we're starting to see models like um, organisations like uh, Australian Institute of Data and Trilogy Education is another one. Um, Academy XI are doing it now, in which they're essentially for domestic students. They're doing a combination of online stuff, immersive stuff, in partnership with universities to try and deliver a different experience. <laughs> I'm wondering whether or not we're seeing those models develop into the traditional source markets that Australia would source international students. I think, I think just to sort of jumping back to your prior point, David, w one of the things that we, one of the mistakes we often make is just looking at the university sector for, you know, as the proxy for, as the proxy for people studying. Yep. So less people are not studying online now than they were five years ago. Uh, they're just using different methods to do so. So not everyone goes to a university to study, you know, uh, to Claire's point, yes, MBA enrollments are declining. Maybe because people are choosing other methods to study and That's learn. Right. Um, so, so uh, and which is a good thing, right? That keeps the university sector competitive. It means that we've got to fight harder to uh, convince students that accredited university providers can still deliver on outcomes that they want. But if a prospective student chooses LinkedIn or YouTube or a, a different, you know, a professional development, their own professional development ahead of um, a pre ahead of a university, then that's not shown up in the data. But a lot of students are studying a variety of ways. Sure okay. uh, David, there's a question for me if you don't yeah. mind. That's been, yeah, by uh, all means. The yes, I'm, 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 I, so I, I actually feel like I should, uh, I should go, go away. Absolutely. <laughs> no, no. Thanks, no, no, guys. No, no. no. It's actually like <laughs> Kathleen's our MC. She'll be back in a second. Okay, well, in the meantime, I'm just going to go to answering. There's a question that's come through for me, which is, do I think there is demand in Asia to deliver accredited VET qualifications mm -hmm. online? And what are the barriers for Australian institutions to do this? Uh, I think actually our biggest barrier is our own training packages model and the, the, uh, the, what it means to have an, an Australian accredited VET qualification. We have, please, very simply, uh, we have made the content of our qualifications, uh, as we should, prescriptive and relevant to working in Australia, which makes it very difficult to deliver in another country, um, where I think there is real demand for Australian vet providers delivering online offshore is in taking all of the knowledge that we have in our qualifications, how to teach plumbers and engineers and you name it, um, but not in a formal accredited sense, to take that expertise and offer it, uh, to give students and uh, people particularly looking to upskill those uh, skills, that industry relevant skills that they need. And if people ever want to come and work in Australia, they can then go through a formal recognition of prior learning uh, opportunity to then have those skills formally accredited. So I think that's it's in the non-accredited space, building off our VET providers' expertise that I think we see opportunities in Asia and elsewhere. Thanks, Craig. Um, I'll just jump over to the Q&A, so don't forget to add any questions you have there. Um, the first one I have for Claire and Ryan is, why can't universities do this on their own? <laughs> Good question. I'm happy to take that one, Claire. Okay. Uh, it's probably directed to me. Um, they can and they do. Uh, so, firstly, universities are delivering online on their own right now, as we all know. But I, I think the question is, why can't a university operate as an OPM or why do they need one, essentially? Uh, so, there are a number of universities in, in Australia that do this or do what we do on their own. Uh, so, I think University of Melbourne have an online uh, offering, 
it's uni SA maybe another one and of course a number of universities that have been doing distance education or forms of it for decades so yes they do and they can do it on their own and, and absolutely they probably will continue to do so uh, the reasons for groups like us and the reasons uh, why they partner with us in to greater extents than they do on their own is that we can uh, bluntly scale it bigger, faster, uh, and, and more aggressively than they can do on their own. We have more people, expertise, resources, IP in this than, than they can typically attribute or afford uh, by themselves. So uh, as an example, we work with uh, eight universities in here. Uh, we manage about 40-ish, 40-ish online programs across all of those, which is you know, very, very small in comparison to an entire university sector. Um, we have about 250 people who do that. So our ratio of people to programs is, is significantly lower than what a university will get. Um, and then just bluntly, we're able to drive a lot more revenue diversification for a university than they're gonna be able to do so themselves. We invest more, we drive a bigger, ret we drive a bigger return. That all said, the, the reason we typically hear from our universities as to why they work with us is that it mitigates the risk for them of going online and damaging their brand if they were to do so badly. So why does a group of eight universities work with us into moving online? Because they have a long storied historic reputation uh, of good delivery that they want to upkeep in a new modality that they know little about. That's our expertise. We're there to ensure that their brand and their history is delivered effectively and with a strong reputation online and that students are retained. Uh, so we've seen far too many examples and to Claire would know well, especially in the vet sector of egregious amount of students pouring into online degrees and then falling out very, very quickly at great cost to all of us as an industry and taxpayers, the last thing we'll want to do is see that again. So we focus heavily on retention and graduation and ensuring that the brand integrity remains true. Uh, Kathleen, you're on mute. Thank you, that's my party trick today. <laughs> um, so we've got a couple of other questions that are aligned to that as well. So I'm trying to pick out the ones that are different. And I'm going to ask this one. Um, can we engage in-country students with online learning programs? I would say Ryan sort of answered that a bit when we were looking at what are the opportunities, I think, for Australian or other providers to be engaging with uh, students in country, whether that's in Southeast Asia or, or elsewhere. Uh, it will require a mind shift from uh, institutions and from learners. I think Ryan's right. Many learners are getting there um, ahead of some institutions. This is, uh, I think COVID-19 has forced a, a rethink for all of us. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yes, I think that uh, engagement online beyond this crisis will become a, a part of the international education experience for many uh, students and, uh, and institutions. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, uh, Ryan, did you want to add anything to that? I'm just wary of time. Yeah, <clears throat> sure. I'll just say it's already happening. Um, so you look at markets like Vietnam, India, Indonesia, uh, hundreds of thousands of students are already studying in country online and choosing to do so. So I, one thing I just want to add quickly is that it's not an either or. You know, we, we, we don't typically see students going, do I go to the campus or do I study online? Uh, and, and we're always conscious of talking about this whenever universities throw up the fear of cannibalization. Online students are typically choosing, do they study online or do they not study at all? So this divergence of choice between online and campus on campus typically doesn't happen. So will it increase in country? Yes, it will. It's already happened. Okay. Um, David, did you want to add anything there? Okay, um, any questions we haven't gotten to, we will address at the end, just so everyone's aware of that. Um, can I thank Ryan and Claire very much for their time? Um, a great oversight of the importance of student experience and engagement, whether it be online or face-to-face -face or blended learning. So thank you very much.